Hey Canucks fans, I'm Clay Emo. I'm at Canuck Clay on Twitter. I'm at Clay Emo on Instagram. I'm the founder of the GLCPC, the Good Looking Canucks Positivity Club. And this is my Canucks take, all in one take. It's Clay's Canucks commentary for Tuesday, April the 14th. Long weekend, Easter long weekend is over. I'm not sure if you're back to your regular life of school and or work. What I'm back to is the Zoom interview, uh, the Zoom interview series that I've started. And Brendan Batchelor, I, I interviewed him yesterday, the voice of the Vancouver Canucks, the play-by-play play voice on Sportsnet 650. Was very grateful to Brendan for taking some time out to chat with me. And now for today, I jumped to the other side of the radio dial and I interviewed Jeff Patterson of TSN 1040. And I was so grateful uh, to Jeff, just as I was to Brendan, for spending some time with me. Um, we go for about an hour. It didn't feel like it, but it's because Jeff is so insightful. He's so knowledgeable. He's so witty. And what I love about Jeff is he recognizes that he's got um, access to the Canucks players and coaching staff and management that uh, we fans, we certainly would never dream of having this access. So Jeff takes that responsibility very seriously. Um, and he takes his job seriously, although he doesn't take himself too seriously. Maybe that's why him and I get along so well. And we share some great stories about podcasting, about, uh, about uh, of course, in, in arena things, in the locker room. And most importantly, I asked him um, his opinion on some really, really important Canucks topics. Free agency, Toffoli, Markstrom, Trampkin, rookies, contracts for Hughes, Pedersen, all of it. We cover it all over this next hour. So I hope you watch the whole thing because... Um, uh, it's certainly worth it. Everything Jeff has to say is is really important and, and really valuable and gives us great insight. So check it out, and I'll come back to you on the other side. Enjoy this interview with Jeff Patterson. Awesome. Jeff, thanks for joining me today. How is your Easter weekend going? Uh, Easter weekend felt like uh, pretty much every other day for the last month. That uh, It was hard to distinguish that it was, in fact, Easter Sunday or Good Friday or a long weekend just because uh, I kind of feel like we're all stuck in a very long weekend these days. But it was all right. Sun was shining. Uh, family's healthy. I'm healthy. Uh, it's not ideal, obviously, yeah. but uh, all things considered, uh, we're, we're, we're slugging it out like everybody else and just grinding it day by day. Awesome. With, uh, I know th me, like thousands of others, follow you on Twitter. It sounds like you're becoming very domesticated, vacuuming, mowing the lawn, all those good things as a dad and as a husband. Hey, life goes on. Uh, even if you can't do it... Uh, you know, the, the way you're used to doing it, but the household chores uh, have to get taken care of. So yes, uh, you know, trying to uh, discover what hidden talents perhaps I have. Uh, you know, in my job, I'm away so much that, uh, look, I will be the first to admit, and I hear it on a regular basis as well, that uh, I sort of uh, don't hold up my end of the bargain <laughs> when it comes to the household chores. So, uh, you know, times like these, I'm sitting around, I got a lot of time on my hands. Uh, yes, the place needed to be vacuumed, and now that uh, spring has sprung, the lawn was getting a little shaggy, so I uh, busted out the lawnmower for the first time this season, and uh, it was good. Looks, lawn the yard looks all right, and yeah. uh, got some work to do still, but uh, again, I've got plenty of time on my hands right now, and the days are uh, decent, so uh, no problem getting out and working in the backyard. And speaking of shaggy or not shaggy, your hair actually looks really good. I was expecting like a, a Bushman look or something. I was fortunate. Uh, you'll recall the Canucks were in Phoenix uh, when the season was halted, and, and I flew out on a Wednesday morning. Uh, that game day, the Islanders game, the final game day, I actually got my hair cut that day, uh, only because I knew I was going to be away for a few more days, and the schedule was heavy, and, and so I'm, you know, I'm kind of right in that window of <laughs> now would be about the time I would want to get a haircut, but... Uh, yeah, it's all right. Uh, again, when you consider uh, what's going on around us in the, the global perspective, if my hair is a little longer than I'd like, uh, I think I'll be all right. That's a good point. Good perspective. And let me know if you need help. I know a guy, obviously. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. Not sure if that will look good on you, but we'll see. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, I have a great admiration, respect for you, uh, Jeff, and all your good work and how uh, faithful and dedicated you are to bringing uh, all of us Canucks fans just and in, uh, behind the you know, behind the scenes look or behind the curtain or every day. So every day going on. So I, I kind of want to ask you a few questions about that, if that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. I, I would love to know, you know, what's your typical day like for a, a home game? For instance, everything, you don't have to go minute by minute, but in the, generally how many radio hits do you do? When do you get to the rink? All those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, you know, in this job and it comes to the territory, you have to be prepared to work weekends and, nights obviously and yeah. it's not a conventional work schedule certainly not a nine to five i've never had a nine to five so uh, this is what i know and you know so it wouldn't be for everybody but if you want to cover professional sports 
uh, games are at night, so uh, and games are on weekends and you know holidays and all those types of things. So you just you always got to be prepared to go with the flow. Uh, a home game, uh, let's just take that Islanders game day, that final game that they played on the 10th of March. You know, I, I generally would have a radio hit in the morning with the morning guys on 1040. Uh, so get up, you know, check my phone, make sure that I'm up to date on anything that's happened overnight. Uh, you know, generally there isn't a lot of Canuck news, but just with time zones, you know, things are happening around the league. So you want to make sure that you're up to speed in case you have to talk on uh, any topic that, you know, uh, relates to the Canucks in some way, but from another market. So uh, a lot of reading. The job entails a lot of reading and, and uh, get up, check the phone, read what I feel I need to read, do my radio hit, you know, get down to the rink around 9.30, 10 o'clock. Game day skates are generally at 10.30, but game day skates are sort of uh, a dying breed. We're seeing it more and more now that, uh, you know, I, I think you'll always see that players will congregate at the rink for meetings, video sessions, uh, maybe work on their sticks and those types of things. But, you know, we're seeing more and more that the morning skate is optional. It's not that big a deal, but it's still an opportunity for us in the media to uh, get some access and to, you know, find out news of the day and who's in the lineup and those types of things. So, you know, I think there'll probably always be some sort of gathering at the rink on morning skates, except when it's the second of back-to-backs, generally the Canucks, so all teams, if it's their second game of back-to-backs and they've traveled and they've got into that next city late, usually they'll just tell the guys, stay away from the rink and, you know, show up at game time and, and away you go. So, you know, for me, go to the rink, uh, always do a head count, see who's on the ice, uh, who's around, you know, you're sniffing around for stories and trying to find out uh, things that may impact the game that night. Uh, you know, Travis is usually available um, after the morning skate, even if it's an optional, uh, you know, so we get our access to the head coach to sort of confirm lineup type things. Uh, I write a game day preview that gets posted at uh, the 1040 website. So, you know, a lot of times I'll write that in the morning or sometimes even the night before and just leave spots and, you know, open for the lineups and any news and notes that I pick up around the rink. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then I generally go on the air from the rink as well, kind of with that news uh go home you know and sort of between one and five you know just hang out again uh, if there's work that needs to be do- done i'll get some work done uh vacuum uh you know the, the important stuff but uh and then you go back to the rink uh, and i generally try to get back to the rink uh, sort of by 5 30 for a seven o'clock game again just to put your ear to the ground you know in the building to see if there's anything happening that uh, uh, could impact the lineup for that night. Uh, I go on the air from the media room on our pregame show on 1040, uh, sort of 50 minutes. So 10 after six for seven o'clock start and then cover the game. And then all that comes along with post game and doing the takeaways that I write for the 1040 website as well. So, you know, it's a mix of uh, being on air, being at the rink, doing interviews, writing, uh, it, that's kind of the job in a nutshell. And, you know, some days are a little bit different than others. Obviously, with the travel I do for the road games, a uh, fair bit of uh, sitting around airports and <laughs> hotels and those types of things. But that comes with the territory, and uh, it's a part of the job. You know, maybe not my favorite part of the job, but uh, I love getting to cover the Canucks is what I've always wanted to do and to be doing it home and away when they're playing. Uh, it's uh, it's a bunch of fun having a blast doing it and especially you know the first two years that I was in this job of traveling and being hands-on uh, let's be honest they haven't been very good there haven't been uh, a lot of nights that have been a lot of fun there's been a lot of losing and so you know that's kind of the frustration of where we are in all of this again it's a small f frustration against the backdrop of uh, the global situation but uh, how would this have played out? 13 games to go right there in the thick of it. You know, these young yeah. players that were starting to emerge and produce. And, it, you know, now it looks like, you know, the next bunch of years could and should be pretty fun uh, for the Vancouver Canucks. So that's kind of the payoff. And, you know, I'm hoping that whenever uh, we return to games being played and whatever the new normal is, uh, you know, I hope that things remain the same uh, from a job perspective because, I remember and then watching, you know, 2011, these replays of games and stuff like, you know, it brings you back to the good times and uh, those good times have been few and far between for the last decade. So uh, I'm hoping I get the opportunity to ride this thing out and, and, you know, be there 
uh, day in, day out uh, on the front line as this team emerges and starts to enter its window of contention. Oh, well, as you're saying all that, it makes me miss it so much as well. Oh, that's... <laughs> I just need a second to compose myself here. So um, I love your takeaways that gets posted to TSN. Um, and I, I will admit, and I think you know this, I read them before I do my vlog in the morning. So often it gives me some, some talking points. So in a typical home game, Jeff, your head's hitting the pillow by what time? 12, 12.30, 1 a.m. sometimes? Yeah, I mean, in that yeah. neighborhood, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, you get the work done. Um, I, I find sometimes it's, uh, a little difficult to get to sleep after games. Just, you know, it, I mean, there's a performance element to what we all do, right? And, and whether you're revved up to do the writing or go on the air, uh, sometimes it's tough to come back down and, you know, like just fall asleep right away. So uh, usually I try to get out of the rink by before midnight uh, and most nights I'm able to, but there are some nights that, uh, you know, you just, you're not quite as creative as others or whatever. It takes a little bit longer, but yeah, I mean, generally you're looking at, uh, trying to shut things down sort of in the <laughs> one one thirty range and, wow. and you know like generally I mean they don't play back-to-back -back games at home very often although one of the weekends that was scrapped was mm. the you know they had Calgary and Anaheim back-to-back -back. but for the most part you know game night is followed by practice and practice is usually at 11 30 the next morning so you know you, you it's not like you have to be up and back on the radio at seven o'clock right. in the morning they usually let me sleep in a little bit uh, the morning after the game so it's all right the schedule yeah. uh, I'm not a huge sleeper as it is so right. uh, uh, yeah I, the, I don't mind the hours of the schedule that, that I keep and speaking of practice you know there's this massive uh, fascination in Canucks Twitter with the Canucks line combos and I picture you <laughs> and Drance and Batch all sitting there ready I don't know if you cut and paste or you're ready to go but do you find that funny how people just get so, and I know Travis Green, usually he plays how he practices. So generally there's not a lot of variation, but he might be trying some things out. But I'm just really fascinated by the fascination of the line combos and how much attention a simple tweet like that from you will get. Yeah, and, and look, I think Botch had a, a big hand in that. I mean, that became sort of running gag on the, the podcast and, you know, it used to drive him nuts how many likes a simple tweet would get if it had Pedersen and Besser and, you know, pick a line mate for them. Uh, and, and so then, of course, I would have to continue to do that just to get back at him. Um, but look, it speaks to the passion in the market, the thirst for knowledge for anything that resembles news. I have, like, it drives me nuts when I look at my own phone and I see six guys that are all sitting around me at practice and we've all tweeted out the same thing, right? So I generally try to now... Uh, you know, just focus on what I think is the most important aspect of the changes. Like I'm not, a, I'm generally not a guy that's going to tweet out four lines, six C right. and, and a goalie. Uh, I do that, you know, with my little spreadsheet just before game time, but at practice, you know, if there is a tweak or a change, I'll try to highlight that because uh, so often you'll see five or six of us that are all there essentially tweeting the same thing. So, you know, I mean, that's always been my strategy with, Twitter and, and all social media is, you know, just try to do something a little differently. Try yeah. to be a little bit unique that separates yourself, stands out, uh, you know, still getting the information out there. Uh, if I can have some fun with it and make somebody laugh or smile, you know, then I'm happy if, yeah. if it connects in that way too. So, uh, you know, you try not to take yourself too seriously, but at the same time, look, we have access that everybody else out there would kill for like to get to do what we do like i i recognize that and so you know uh, where other people are uh, you know more opinionated maybe or some are getting scoops out there you know like i my job is hockey reporter and so first and foremost like i'm just trying to get the nuts and bolts of the day uh to you know to get that news out there to people that want it and and so uh, you know, that's kind of the strategy for me when I'm covering practices is, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you a full play-by-play -play account of every drill that they're doing. But if I see things that, you know, I think are interesting, then I kind of figure you know, if they're interesting to me, uh, they're probably going to be interesting to other people as well. And, you know, th that's sort of how I come at the job is, again, I've got access. Uh, you know, I want to use it and use it properly. And I just think... You know, I generally try, like, I think I have a pretty good handle and, and through social media, you get a pretty good feel for 
uh, what's being discussed, what's being kicked around out there. Uh, you know, and so I try to take questions that I think fans would ask if they were in the same position uh, into the locker room or to Travis Green when he's available at the podium. Yeah, no, I think that that comes out, comes through loud and clear, Jeff. And I think uh, the fact that you have this access, yet you don't take it for granted. Like, I love what you said. You, you, you take your job very seriously. You might not take yourself as seriously. And I think that comes through the playfulness and the wittiness. So I know I appreciate that. And I love what you said about the line changes. It makes more sense to say McEwen's in for Erickson. And then people who know the team, they know that who the top six is. They know who the six uh, you know, D-men are. So that seems to make more sense um i gotta ask you right and, and yeah, yeah well just on, on that yeah. quickly let me say and and again i go back to the pack cast and and the pack cast was always just two guys that you know even though our job was to cover for the hockey club you know we were two guys that just like talking about the hockey club like any other two guys and uh you know there was sort of one rule of the, the pack cast was always keep up right like you know we weren't going to explain at the start of every pack cast sort of who the characters that we were referring to, a botch had his nickname for people. Like there was an assumption that people that were with us had been with us throughout. And, and you know, I, I sort of approached Twitter that same way. Like, you're right. I, if I'm tweeting from practice the morning after, I'm working on the assumption that people know the line combinations from the night before. And so it's, yeah, it's not as important to me to lay them all out like that. It's just, here's the most significant things that I see yeah. on the ice that have changed from, you know, 12 hours earlier when they were actually playing the game. Well, that's a great point. And that beautiful segue, which I know you're good at. I want to talk about the Pat cast. I want to talk about the van cast uh, with, uh, you know, we, our beloved Jason Botchford. Um, I'd love to know though, and we know your, we know of your love and your admiration for Botch. We all, a lot of us share that. What's a, what's a difference that's kind of interesting between, uh, you know, uh, working with Botch and working with Thomas Drance? Because I love the, the van cast. I love what you guys are doing. You haven't you missed a beat. You gave a, pro a proper pause, a respectful pause before you got going again. But you're up and running and, and things are going well. Um, so what's maybe one subtle difference or nuance between a recording with Botch and recording with Thomas Drance? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference is that we do two a week at the van cast, two sort of half hourlies, where the back cast was an hour. Uh, but once a week, and, you know, I'm still fighting my way with the van cast. I think Thomas and I are still kind of, uh, you know, we've had some really good episodes. I think our most recent one where we kind of laid out what we think the next contracts for both Patterson and Hughes, you know, I mean, that's a, 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 it's a big discussion. And even though it may not truly impact, you know, the next day or two or week or two for the Canucks, I mean, it's that backdrop against, which everything's going to have to be considered uh, this summer. And uh, like, it's a fascinating topic. And, you know, I thought we drilled down at a time when people are looking for hockey content. So if they haven't had a chance, uh, you might want to check that one out. Uh, but, you know, for Botch and I, so much of it was sort of story time, right? It was yeah. kind of within our jobs, uh, what had happened in the week that we thought was funny, uh, that we thought the people would think was funny. And with the full week, it gave you time to sort of gather and collect some stories and usually, you know, four, sometimes five games between recording. Yeah. So that provided a lot of material. With Drancer, you know, we're trying to go early in the week and then late in the week. Ideally, it would kind of be Monday and Thursday. Uh, but if there's only one game in there, you know, we had both agreed that we didn't want it to turn into essentially a half-hour breakdown of one <laughs> game yeah. but there have been some episodes where you know that's really all that's changed since the last time we had recorded so you know i don't think we have as many opportunities i don't think it breathes the way that the podcast did and frankly i mean when the podcast reached its height around this time last year you know there was some real anticipation like people we would all the time like when's the podcast coming out right because it wasn't a set time it was you know we had to work getting into our schedule and our schedule and travel and everything else so you know we would always get badgered like when's the podcast coming out <laughs> um and you know i think that showed like people were into it they there was real anticipation of when was the next episode going to drop you know hopefully we were getting to that point with the vancast as well but but that's one of the big differences uh tom's a super smart guy and he's been fun and and you know i i've known him for a while but his first year back on the beat and uh, you know, so it took us a little time just to kind of find our way. And we wanted to make sure that, as you pointed out, there was ample separation. We weren't trying yeah. to be the podcast. We weren't trying to replace the podcast. I wanted to keep podcasting. 
Um, you know, there were some political corporate battle lines drawn that I couldn't work with certain people. Um, and we had to pull some strings to make it work with the athletic and at the athle athletic site. And, you know, I'm glad that uh, we were able to make it happen. And so it's been fun. And yeah, I mean, we're trying to grind through here right now as you are, uh, you know, there are no games and look, games yeah. drive the storylines, right? Like, uh, and so we're trying to be creative. We're trying to come up with topics that we think will engage Canuck fans and, and give them a little bit of a break. If we think we can provide some insight at some point, the news cycle will pick up. Like I'm so divided in where we are right now. And, and I get that hockey's a, a low priority in the grand scheme, but you know, there's a big part of me that wishes the NHL would just scrap this yeah. year, say that there isn't going to be a champ. Uh, and do everything in its power to be ready to get up and running as usual in the fall, get a full season in. And, uh, you know, and if they could do that, it would allow the league then to set a draft date, free agency date. And I totally understand the economics of all of this, that they're holding out hope of being able to play, uh, even though it's empty buildings, just to get it on TV, there are dollars and big dollars at play here. So I understand that. Uh, and so there's no need or urgency on their part to make the decision, the finale, the, the, you know, the finality of putting this season to bed. But right. if they did, it would then allow us to know when the draft was going to happen and when free agency, and that would heat things up on the news cycle and give us some things to look forward to. Because right now there will be a draft, there will be uh, free agency, but obviously the draft order is dependent on, uh, the final standings <laughs> and you know all those conditional draft picks that are out there like there are a number of conditional draft picks that have been traded you know that where the condition is if a guy plays x amount of playoff games or the team that he got traded to gets to the second round or wins the stanley cup and you know i mean the league like how how do you determine what's fair or how you move forward with those types of situations if the cup's not awarded and playoffs don't take place so you know, there are some serious, serious questions that have to be answered. I don't have those answers right now, uh, but like everybody, I mean, I'm fascinated and we'll reach a point where, uh, you know, the league, the, the teams have to know the answers to those so that they can start moving forward and, and prepare for the draft whenever it is and, you know, in whatever shape it, it takes. That's a great point, uh, Jeff. It's not just, oh, the Canucks have their first round conditional going to Tampa that's now in New Jersey. It's yeah, it's not just based on standings, it's uh, performances and how many games yep. and how many points. That's a really good point. Two really quick uh, podcasting points I want to bring up and then we'll move on. Um, I've been the beneficiary. I've been blessed to be the subject of a couple of those great stories, uh, you and Botch. One of them was in San Jose, obviously, meeting Elias Patterson. Here's my uh, all-star San Jose Cup. I did that on purpose. And then the other one, of course, was uh, Louis Erickson and, and then you, uh, me and you having fun about how tough can we be on Louis Erickson in the media. But you, d you guys were master storytellers. And I do also love the way that you and Thomas, I think you've kind of, um, in my opinion, you've, you have a really good handle of exactly what you just talked about for the last couple of minutes, how, yes, this is serious. There are way bigger problems and who's going to have our first round draft pick in, in, in June. But at the same time, people are looking for stories. So that's why I found that discussion on Pedersen and Hughes's contract so engaging and so interesting because it's not just something that's going to affect us on October 5th on 2020. This is something that's going to affect us eight, 10 years down the road. So I love basically how you said, okay, Tom, I'm going to say it's $19.5 million. Combine the two guys with it's 11 and eight or 11 and nine. So I, I want to know your opinion. Um, I know there are, a lot, there are a lot of unknown factors, but what, what do you think uh, are, you, are we looking at for a next Peters, uh, contract for Pedersen and next contract for Hughes? Yeah, I mean, if people haven't heard, uh, again, I would suggest they listen to the whole episode, <laughs> but uh, uh, to give it away, Grants was taking the over, uh, and in fact, went, I think, 20 and a half yes. combined, which, you know, that's a little, like, that's daunting, and, and you know, I mean, it, the good news is it means you've got these extremely talented players, right, and, and the Canucks haven't had those types of uh, cap breakers and Louis broken the cap in his own way, but not, uh, not the way people wanted uh, the cap broken. But, you know, I mean, young players, elite young players get paid. And, and other teams have encountered this issue. And you look at the Leafs and you look at the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, to me, the Jets are always that cautionary tale that, mm. you know, they, everybody looked at them as uh, the model franchise of drafting and developing. And, you know, maybe didn't have the benefit of all the bells and whistles uh, as far as the city was concerned to attract 
players and keep players, uh, you know, but they drafted so well and, and they got these young players and they looked like they were legitimate Stanley Cup contenders. And then the young guys all came out of their entry level deals. They needed to get paid. And, you know, you look at what happened to their defense and, and, you know, they came back to the pack and they, they still got a bunch of talented players, but yeah. I don't think anybody looks at them right now and says they're cup contenders the way that we thought they were, you know, two or three years ago. So that's the cautionary tale is you can assemble all this good young talent. It needs to get paid. And then, uh, it, you know, it forces other guys out. It just, it does. That's the math. And, you know, in a flat cap or if the cap declines, uh, these issues become even more prevalent for the Vancouver Canucks where they are. So uh, I think Quinn Hughes, based on his rookie season, uh, is just getting started. I, like, I have no reason to think that he won't be able to pick up and replicate and, and probably improve on what he did this year. And, you know, I think the Thomas Shabbat deal in Ottawa is the baseline. And people may not want to hear it, but you know, Shabbat had a 55-point season and got the max deal, eight years, you know, $8 million per. Like, I think that the Hughes camp would say, look, our guy is younger, has produced more. Uh, this is the market for puck-moving, high-scoring defensemen that run power plays in the NHL, uh, Canadian market, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so I, I would think that the Hughes camp would say that deal – is the starting point. Yep. You know, where it goes from there, who knows? I mean, <laughs> is he going to, you know, is he going to set records in terms of that second contract? You know, and as Grant's pointed out, like it's going to be a fascinating summer next year with guys like McCarr and Heiskanen and Rasmus nope. Dahlin yeah, and Buffalo, four, like yeah. all of them. What a time. And are they all going to sit and wait? who wants to be the first guy to sign? Right. Cause it's quite possible that the first guy is just kind of setting the new market and the other guys are going to, I exceed it. So it's going to be a fascinating dance of, you know, agents and teams and the marketplace and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think you're looking at upwards of eight for Hughes. Mm -hmm. Pedersen, you know, I mean, the numbers don't lie. I mean, the guy's basically been a point of game guy his first two seasons. Again, he should only get better if he stays healthy. Uh, there's no reason that the power play can't be pretty much as good as, uh, it had been all year, and, and in some way, I mean, maybe it's better just with experience. Like the fact that you know Hughes will be in his second year and has seen the NHL, and you know they tried to take Pedersen away, but the guy's so smart and so driven that you know he'll want to get that one timer back as a weapon <laughs> and part of the, the Canucks power play arsenal. And I know if they sign to Foley and uh, give some new looks, so you know I, I don't see any reason why Pedersen's production is going to dip. Um, and if that's the case, if he stays anywhere close to a point of game guy. You know, then you're looking at, and the examples are out there. I, not McDavid, but you know, you, and take the guys after him, whether it's Eichel, whether yeah. it's Austin Matthews, whether it's Mitch Marner. Uh, you know, there are those kind of contracts out there for players coming off their entry level deals that have been uh, elite point producers, and Elias Pettersson's one of them. So, uh, you know, I set the line at 19 and a half mil for the two of them combined. I, I yeah. still sort of think that uh, that's the ballpark, but. Grant's thought over, and that's fine. I mean, Thomas has studied the stuff and is a sharp guy. So uh, if it's over, you know, I won't be surprised. I just I want to believe that somehow, some way, I you know, I just don't know what this global situation is going to do to the salary cap. That may be the only thing yeah. that is able to put a drag on uh, some of these contracts moving forward, and that's really unfortunate for these young guys. I mean, through no fault of their own, right? But uh, if the revenue's not there and the cap number isn't where they want it to be, you know, there's only so much money to go around ultimately. So mm -hmm. it's going to have an impact. It will, but, uh, you know, make no mistake, Patterson and Hughes are getting paid. <laughs> and I just, you know, where I, 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 there was a time where I thought, you know, the organization may make a play to try to get those deals done after July 1st this year, uh, because I think the price only goes up if both of them excel again. But I just, you know, I, I, I can't see why either of those guys would sign now or when they're allowed to uh, you know i just think for both of them uh continue to do their thing and they're only going to help their own case and and in the case of hughes you know that other group of defensemen i, I really do think that there's kind of going to be a wait and see there to uh see how the market plays out for those four. Oh, great answer jay what a problem to have when you're talking about hughes in the company of mccarr darlene and heiskanen and then you're talking about marner 
and Matthews and Dreisaitl as the, the floor, right, for, for Pedersen. That's pretty exciting. So, yes, I encourage everyone watching this, this vlog to go, if you haven't listened to the, the recent VanCast, um, a fascinating 10- to 15-minute discussion on just simply the two contracts. So we have contracts, Nikita Trampkin, is he in a Canucks uniform next season? Oh, I'm going to say no, but I do think the Canucks will explore this, and, and I think they should. I, I think defense is an area that they've got to improve, and I think you have to look at every avenue available to you. And, um, you know, we just don't know what's going to happen with Tanev. We don't know what's going to happen with Stetcher. Uh, Jordy Ben, I think his future and can get into the lineup. Uh, yeah. You know, is there a way they could move off his, his deal? Uh, Fantenberg's up, you know. I mean, yeah. Fantenberg had – he had some moments, but I'm not sure that there's enough there or, you know, he can't replace a guy like that. So, um, you know, I, I think that they're going to have to look at revamping their defense. And, you know, I mean, I've heard the comments of Trampkin's agent and, and look, we kind of know what he is. Yeah. Um, it didn't sound like he went back to Russia and really improved a ton. Mm. Um, you know, the league's getting faster all the time. Foot speed was never his thing. You know, could I see them reaching a deal where he was the third pairing guy? Yeah, on the left side. You know, I mean, he showed a little bit of versatility that mm -hmm. he could play the right as well. And, you know, to me, the, the right side of the Canucks defense is sort of one of the real hot spots here in the offseason. Yeah. Um, and so I'm fascinated to see ultimately how that all plays out. But, you know, keep in mind that, he wants to get paid. I don't think he's got a ton of leverage, but when you're looking at resigning Markstrom and Toffoli and, you know, where does Josh Levo factor into all this? And then Vertanen, and who knows what statue, like, you know, there just, there isn't going to be a ton of money to go around. And, and so, um, you know, it may come down to dollars and cents. I mean, it, it's possible that they could peddle him. I don't think that, you know, his rights would have a ton of market value, but, mm. You know, I mean, if you could get something in return, if there was a team out there that thought, yeah, you know, six foot eight defensemen don't grow on trees, there might be some intrigue there. Um, but I just, I don't know. My, my gut tells me that he won't be in the Canucks lineup, but I do think that they have to explore that and a number of other options to try to upgrade their defense. Yeah, uh, well, absolutely. I, I agree with you. I wasn't the biggest Trampkin fan, but we'll see. He, he might be a nice cost, you know, uh, a cost prohibitive uh, player here, given that, yeah, you're right. You add up all the UFAs and the RFAs. I think you add them up, you know, the, the Marshall Toffoli's, Tanev, Stetcher, Bertanen, Levo, Fantenberg, as you said, all these guys. And I think they add up to between 21 and 24 million in this year's cap. And you're obviously not going to, these guys are all looking for raises. So there's no way you can bring all those guys back. But the question I get Jeff most on my, when I do my little YouTube live streams is if you can only pick one, Jacob Markstrom or Tyler Toffoli, we've been hearing numbers about five and a half or six, maybe for Markstrom, maybe Toffoli goes up to five, five and a half. If you can only pick one, who would you take on our team next year? Jacob Markstrom or Tyler Toffoli? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I never look at it that way. Like, right, I mean, right. I can have an opinion, but ultimately I'm not the one that's making the decisions, right? I, I, I get the feeling that Markstrom is the top of their priority list. And you know, the Seattle expansion is going to complicate things. There's no question about that. But uh, I think, you know, there are ways around that when the time comes. Mm -hmm. So I think, first and foremost, Markstrom has proven in their eyes. Travis Green's got a track record. Going back to Utica with him, uh, he does look like he has emerged as, uh, you know, a true number one and, and fairly elite goaltender, you know, for the last year and a half. He's also 30. And, and so, you know, the, the idea of locking in long-term goalies, it, that market changes so quickly and uh, so often that, you know, the guy you've got now, a year from now, honestly, you know, like you, when you think of where the Canucks were when the play stopped, I mean, they were right at the playoff bar. And that was with this elite goaltending for much of the season. Um, you know, what if his play drops five or 10%, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, it could happen. Like there's nothing to say that Markstrom is on this trajectory. That's just going to keep getting better from, from here on out. Uh, but he has, his timing has been great to reach unrestricted free agency uh, with the, play, the way that he's played. Uh, and I, I, I think he's their priority. Mm -hmm. I think Tafoli is the second priority. I mean, they make the trade, they get 10 very productive games out of him. He looked good on that first line. He looked good on the power play. Yeah. Uh, but keep in mind too, that, 
you know, Toffoli gets some say in all of this too, right? Like uh, he's going unrestricted free agency or he could go for the first time in his career. I just, I wasn't around him long enough to really ever get a sense of, and I mean, 10 games, he couldn't have truly gotten a feel for uh, the team, the organization, certainly not the city uh, because he was locked down, you know, the, 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 most of the time he was here. So uh, I've looked at the unrestricted market and, you know, Taylor Hall's out there, Mike Hoffman, Mm -hmm. Toffoli's probably the third or fourth when it comes to like legitimate goal scorers that could be on the open market. Yeah. You know, those guys get paid, right? All it takes is one team to make a goofy offer and uh, the Canucks aren't really in a position to get into a bidding war. Um, so, you know, I, I think they would like to make it happen. I'd be excited to see a top six the way it was for that Islanders game, um, you know, and, and, Offense wasn't an issue for this team. Yeah. Right. Even before to fully offense wasn't an issue, but I mean, that would give them two legitimate top six or top, you know, two top lines. Yeah. Um, I liked an awful lot of what I saw from Adam Gaudet this year. Uh, he continues to emerge and I think, you know, there's still a little bit of room for him to grow, you know, so I see the makings of, you know, a pretty nice offensive group if they can get to fully done. But to your point, you know, there, there is a limited, amount of money to go around yeah. there will be guys squeezed out it's just that's just the reality and you know if it's Tanev, that's unfortunate but you know i, I do worry about locking into a long-term deal uh with chris Tanev at his age and it was great that he played every game this season but mm -hmm. you know i don't think you can get fooled into thinking that you know somehow he has turned a page and this is gonna he's iron man now you know moving forward uh you know, it was just, it was great. He played there and, and he was a huge benefit to Quinn Hughes and, you know, not just on the ice, but off the ice in the room. I think uh, just a, around town, they seem to have forged a pretty good friendship and spent a fair bit of time together. So there was, a, you know, a, a value to his mentorship, but mm. to me, it's more the, you know, could Chris Tanev come back and play and help him again next year? Probably, but yeah. you know, he in a position to command four or five years and probably have more money than, uh, they have. So somebody's going to go and, and, you know, it probably won't just be one guy. And that's where I keep coming back to that right wing. Um, and I'm not trying to run anybody out of town, but yeah. if, you know, if they sign to Foley and you got Besser, you know, I like Josh Levo. I, I, and, and I think there's probably value there because he only played half a season, but if you sign Levo, you know, you got Zach McEwen who started to emerge and looked like he was a legitimate NHL, like, you know, I haven't even got to Rotanen, but there's not enough room for all these guys, right? And so yeah. uh, these are the decisions that Jim Benning and John Weiss brought and Travis Green and the whole management and coaching staff, you know, they've got to figure out. But the first thing is they need to know the salary cap. I mean, they, they can't do their heavy lifting until they know what that number is and the league isn't ready to set that number because it still wants to generate revenue and, and play some hockey games this year. Right, right. Yeah, and I've heard you uh, many times on the radio talk about how the right side of the Canucks is so fascinating, right? Between the, yeah. the forwards of Toffoli, Besser, Vertanen, McEwen, as you mentioned, Levo. Then on D, you have, yeah, Myers coming back, but what about Tanev and what about Stetcher? It is, uh, and you said Tramkin can play both sides. So um, I want to ask you this one. Do you anticipate any of Yolevi, Rafferty, or Colin making the team next year? Those are the three rookies to me. I know Rafi's a little older, but those are the three rookies to me that seem at least to have a chance uh, of at least getting a spot or at least fighting for a spot. I think Rafferty is in the best position. I, I think they groomed him this year, uh, kept him down in Utica when they could have called him up, but they wanted him to keep playing. And, you know, they knew that guys like Chatfield were just up here as insurance policies. And so, uh, you know, everything I kind of read in there and, and they're not going to come out and say, Hey, this guy's got a spot next year, but, you know, when you read between the lines and you look at that right side, uh, there certainly looks and feels like there's an opportunity, a strong opportunity uh, for Brogan Rafferty to play here in Vancouver next year. Uh, Cole Lynn, you know, I was really encouraged for him. Like mm -hmm. that first year as a pro was disappointing. And, and I kind of did wonder, like, you know, both him and Gadjevich, second round picks, like where was that headed? Um, you know, Gadjevich looks like a, a long shot, but, Cole Lind, I think, has put himself right back on the list of legitimate prospects. And uh, that's good. It's good for him and it's good for the Canucks. You know, I think next year is the kind of year where uh, you'd like to see him get a shot. Do I see him making the team out of camp? That seems like a long shot just based on, you know, the bodies that they've got. 
But look, when we get into these big time contracts, guys on entry level deals are going to have huge value to the Vancouver Canucks. And that could yes. work in, in a guy like Cole Lynn's favor, because you're going to need some guys that fill out roster spots that are, you know, on the low end of the, the pay scale. So, um, you know, I, I think next year looks like the kind of year that Cole Lynn should get an opportunity to play in the NHL. Mm -hmm. uh, but he probably, you know, he's probably not going to start with the big club. And you'll levy your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> like I, 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 I hope for this guy. I hope he gets a chance to play in the NHL. But, you know, when I see reports as recently as last week that he's 100% healthy, uh, you know, that just it, – it, and that's not a knock on him or his agent or, you know, it's just it, – that's kind of where we are with him, that we need to be reminded when he's healthy, right? Like, what a tough lot in life. Uh, but that's his – that is his lot in life. And so – you know, I, I kind of was working under the assumption that he was healthy. I, I didn't feel like I needed this update that he, oh, he'll have he's healthy. Okay. But <laughs> again, like that's, we need this reminder uh, from time to time. You know, the, the reports that I've heard, and look, I'm not a guy, I'm so locked into the big league clean team. I don't spend much time watching Utica, but, you know, I, there are people that do and that I trust. You know, the reports about his foot speed still remain an issue. And if, there are injuries, you know, whether it's his hip or you know, mm -hmm. the knee. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not going to help with foot speed. And then again, to play in the NHL, like you've got to be able to move. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope he gets a chance. I hope he gets, whether it's with the Canucks ultimately, like, I kind of feel like the Canucks are going to uh, do everything in their power to get him a game just so they can kind of hold him up there and say, see, we knew he was an NHLer, but, <laughs> but you can't, you know, you can't be patient forever yeah. for the guy. And I also think, you know, we're uh, in an off season where Jim Benning is probably going to have to look long and hard at attaching some sweeteners to move contracts, whether it's Louis Erickson, whether it's Brandon Sutter, uh, Jay Beagle, uh, yeah. whatever the case, Sven Verci. Yeah. You know, like, look, they've already given up their first rounder to Tampa in the Miller deal. They traded a second with Madden to get to Foley. Uh, now you're talking about uh, attaching a sweetener of some kind to get out from under contracts, whether that's a prospect. And, and look, if you're another team, you oh, I'll, I'll take a look at Brandon Sutter, but my guess is teams would be asking for Cole Lind or Jack Rathbone or uh, Michael DiPietro. Uh, you know, I, I think Pod Colson and Hoglander are probably non-starters. Agreed. But beyond that, you know, it, 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 other teams, I mean, they can shoot for the moon, right? They can ask for anything they want, whether it ends out there, um, you know, we'll see. But keep in mind, too, when I talked about resigning Markstrom and the Seattle expansion, you know, one way to get around your problems is to slide Seattle something to, you know, if they had to expose that to Demko, mm -hmm. um, you know, then you're looking at negotiating with Seattle so that they don't pick Demko. But You've given up your first rounder. You're giving up a second rounder to LA. We're talking about adding a sweetener to get out from under contracts. Now you're talking about peddling something. Just like you got to get better too, right? Like you, you can't just keep giving away assets and draft picks at the same time you're trying to get better. And so that's such a, a delicate dance that management has to do. And you know, I, I think that's a question that you have to keep coming back to when you talk about this off season and re-signing all of your free agents. That's great re-signing your free agents essentially only maintains what you've got. How do they get better? Right? Yeah. Like that, you know, other teams around them are either ahead of them on the curve or are right there with them. Like it's not just the Canucks trying to improve in a vacuum. Right. They're trying to build a team that can compete with Colorado or St. Louis or, you know, I, people don't want to hear it, but like the Oilers look like they're starting to figure things out. Right. So the Canucks can continue to improve, but, ultimately to go deep in the playoffs and win the Stanley cup, you got to be better than those teams around you. And so how do they improve? Yeah. You're going to get some improvement from within like Pedersen and Hughes are going to continue to get better. Brock Besser is better than a 16 goal score. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there, there is some room for improvement from within, but ultimately you look at the bottom six, you look at the defense, you know, there are still areas that need to be addressed that need to be shored up. And it's tough to do that when you're giving out these massive contracts that they're going to have to give out and you're giving away or throwing in uh, prospects or draft picks 
to make some of your problems go away. Like, you know, there are only so many ways you can get better. You can get better by trade. You can get better uh, from drafting well. Uh, you can get better from, you know, improvement from within. But, you know, if you're trying to get better from within through your draft picks, you want to have some of those draft picks, right? It's like lottery <laughs> tickets. No, I mean, people make that point all the time. I mean, the more lottery tickets you have, the more draft picks you have, the better chance that one of them is going to hit and be able to help your hockey club. You can't continually be uh, sending those things down the, the river. So, just keep that in mind as you, you know, it's not just how do they sort of maintain what they've got. They're not Stanley Cup contenders yet. So how do they get better incrementally here over the next bunch of years? Well, great answer. And just a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll ra- end off with our rapid fire section. But uh, who's your favorite Canucks player to interview? It's a pretty good group right now yeah. in that room. I, I always like talking to Troy Stetcher. I just, I, I really... I don't know if it's because he's got the Vancouver background that he kind of understands the history and the context and what the team means. I, you know, I think that helps. I, I think yeah. a lot of them get that part, but he's grounded. And I just, I find with him, he'll, you ask a question, he'll give you an answer and not that other guys won't, but some of these guys are pretty skilled in, you know, talking and talking and talking and ultimately saying nothing. Um, and you know, they're fulfilling their obligation but they're not giving you much, but you know, Stetcher will tell you if the team's playing poorly, he's not afraid to say that. If uh, you know, he sees something he doesn't like, he'll admit it. And, and not calling teammates out, but he's just, there's an honesty in his answer. He's not, I, I don't find that he's ever trying to hide or deflect. He just, he answers honestly. And I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. You know, JT Miller, uh, there's sort of an unvarnished quality about the yeah, guy yeah. just on the ice, off the ice uh, in the room. And, and he's been good. I mean, he's had some nights where, uh, you know, you can tell that he's, he's pissed off at the results <laughs> or the way he's played. And, uh, you know, there have been a few nights along the way where he hasn't been that easy to deal with. But, again, that comes from his competitive nature. And I'm okay. Like over 82 games, if a guy has a couple nights after where he doesn't want to talk to the media or is short with media, like, I get it. You know, they're, they're frustrated. This is their livelihood. And, and the wins and losses mean an awful lot to mm. – to them so uh but he's been good he's been terrific on the ice and, and he's just been a good addition in that locker room um you know i keep hearing and i've kind of taken this as a pet project whenever they get back to work uh to sort of crack the code that is jacob markstrom because <laughs> as recently as last week antoine roussel on his uh, canucks q a on instagram you know he was asked who the funniest canuck was and he said markstrom he didn't hesitate he just said markstrom and i, I tell you in that room every day, practices, game day skates, post game, you know, Markstrom's not the funniest guy mm. to those of us that are in the room 10 minutes at a time. Like, right. we get a different Jacob Markstrom, but I know that that character is in there. You can sense it. You can sometimes you get a, a little peek at it. Um, and again, like, he stands in there and answers all the questions. And, mm. uh, you know, that guy's as much a competitor as anybody. And I think has actually done a nice job of. Uh, compartmentalizing, you know, I, I think he took the losses all so personally. He took every goal against him personally. And, and you know, I understand that when your job is to stop the puck. But, you know, I used to think that kind of worked against him. He's mellowed a little bit now on the ice and, and even in the room. But I don't see – we don't get to see sort of the, the humor side of Jacob Marshall, but I'd love to because when I hear a teammate just, you know – answer that that quickly that oh Mark's like no hesitation mm-hmm. uh, there's got to be a reason there so he's kind of holding that on us i think so maybe i'll take that on as a personal project to uh, to get to the bottom of what makes jacob markstrom as funny as his teammates uh, believe that he is oh i love that i know you guys talked about it on the van cast as well that uh love troy stetcher as you know i live in richmond jeff so i always loyal to those guys and jt miller i love what you said because i've seen the best and worst of him so to speak at the golf tournament in september the funniest, most sarcastic player making fun of everyone, his teammates, his, his foursome. And then I saw him at a fan thing. Remember, it's a fan thing, and it looked like he didn't want to be there. So who knows? Yeah, yeah. I'm not here to judge, yeah. right? It's just – but, yeah, it's, it's up and down for sure for all these guys, I, I can imagine. A uh, couple more. What's your favorite road city uh, to travel to and work in? Uh, New York City. I'm a, a massive New York City guy. I just yeah. like, have been there a bunch of times and don't even feel like I've scratched the surface and, you know, try to pick off – different neighborhoods uh, each time I go just there's so much to see and do um so yeah love New York City yeah um you know it's tough to see it 
in the condition that's in right now, but um, you know, it, it'll pull through and prevail. But um, yeah, I mean, when I think of you know some of the places that I've been, and now I see them, you know, you think of Central Park and they're putting up mm. field hospitals and stuff, and it's just it, it it's crushing. But um, yeah, I mean, Madison Square. When I got the job and knew that I was going to be traveling. I had been in Madison Square Garden before, but it was in the summertime. And I paid my own money for the tour of Madison Square. So, uh, and it was going way back. In fact, it was the summer right after Gretzky retired as a ranger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they took us into the ranger locker room and they still had uh, Gretzky's stall was all there with all the gear in it and stuff as part of the tour. Uh, but I hadn't seen the rink and ice down. And, and so when I found out that I was, you know, I got the job and I was going to be traveling, that was absolutely Number one on the list was to see a hockey game, a Canucks game at Madison Square. Um, so that was just another kind of layer of uh, why New York City. But like, there's a ton of great cities. I had never been to Nashville before. I had heard so much about Nashville mm. and how much fun it is. And I kind of thought people were just talking and, you know, it's the, oh, yeah, Nashville is great. You know, uh, I've been there now a bunch of times and I can see, I can see why people love Nashville. As well. I mean, it's just a nice looking city with, you know, a big river that runs through it and clean and um obviously the music scene at night and and um yeah like, so it, it just uh I've kind of come to appreciate nashville um i love the game presentation in vegas i've talked about this uh, many times but you know i hadn't been back to vegas for probably i don't know 15 years or something before <laughs> hockey was there like it just not you know it, it, i wouldn't put it on the top of my list of favorite cities but man like if people haven't had the chance to go to a game yet uh the experience is it's off the charts and they do it upright i mean they do it as you'd expect in vegas and so um, i give them full marks for the game presentation and um, just kind of everything that goes into the production that makes it sort of vegas -y. uh where else uh, you know chicago i never got a chance to go to a game at the old chicago stadium but you know, watching those Canuck Blackhawks playoff series three years in a row, you know, you kind of gain an appreciation for United Center and the atmosphere and the anthem there. And so, you know, to see that and to cross off uh, the anthem. But, you know, I, I've seen it when the Blackhawks are, you know, sort of at the bottom of their competitive cycle and the Canucks haven't been great the last couple of years. So they've been pretty insignificant games. Like I can only imagine what the atmosphere was like mm. uh, in that place when it was packed and it was playoffs and they were winning cups and those types of things. So uh, hopefully get a chance to see it with a little more meat on the bone in terms of significance of, you know, the game. Oh, great answer. And actually funny, I've been to some of those arenas, but not for hockey games for like uh, church conferences and stuff. Uh, but the Vegas one, yeah, I went last year to see Vegas versus Minnesota and you're so right, Jeff. It's so loud. It's so over the top. But they somehow made the Minnesota Wild look exciting. So I don't, right. I don't know what they're yeah. doing there. <laughs> exactly. That's the magic. Magic oh, of Vegas. Exactly. Okay. So, oh, this has been so, so good. Um, let's wind up with what I call the six pack. And I just started calling it this because I just started it. But it's six very quick questions. Uh, you do not have to elaborate if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. Three of them personal and three of them Canucks related. And then we'll end off. Is that okay? Yeah. Hit me. Awesome. Number one, are you an extrovert or an introvert? an introvert full stop yeah i mean i think that's part of why i got into radio you can hide behind a microphone you don't have to deal with people even though you are dealing with an audience but uh, there is an element of uh just being in a quiet room and sort of doing your own thing so uh when i see people that are truly extroverts i realize that i'm an introvert gotcha but i do like your tsn hits i've seen you on with farhan and I've, on the web i've seen you with sarah lesky in winnipeg you're pretty good on tv <laughs> yeah but again that's just you and a camera right it's yeah. not and like i've done some live event sure. things and botches tribute night at the yeah. uh you know at the condor like i'm not afraid to do it but i just you know i'm a, a bit of a homebody and and kind of keep to myself for the most part awesome question number two very very uh, appropriate given everything we talked about if you can only pick one who is more important to the future of the vancouver canucks elias Pettersson or Quinn Hughes? Ooh. Uh, I would this say is, Quinn Hughes just yeah. by nature of the position that he plays. And that's, and now people are going to have, you don't like Beanie? No, that's not it at all. Yeah. I can sit and watch Elias Pettersson play all day, uh, all year. But I just think the nature of the position, 50 years of Canuck hockey, and they have an 
ever had anything that comes remotely close to uh, what Quinn Hughes is able to do already as a 20-year-old rookie. And it's just going to be a blast to watch this guy get better in the years ahead. So uh, with all due respect to Elias yeah. Pedersen, and I hope he's around for a long, long time, to answer your difficult question, yes. I am siding with Quinn Hughes. I would agree with you. I don't think anyone would have picked uh, Quinn Hughes at the start of this season, but we saw what he did this season. Number three, are you a Netflix or Disney Plus guy? Yeah. Um, I suppose I'm more Netflix than Disney Plus. So my kids are a little further along on the curve. So we've done our cartoon years. Oh, I mean, I know there's more than that. On uh, I'm not a Star Wars guy. And, and right. I will admit that up front. Star Wars. Uh, you're talking a different language, even though I've seen a couple of them, uh, they still don't make much sense to me. So and not a lot of use for Disney Plus. So I, I would say Netflix. Ditto. And uh, just this is a part of the six pack. What's the age range of your kids, Jeff? Uh, one just turned 14 and the other is 16. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm about the same. I got an 18, 16 and 12. Awesome. Okay. Question number four. Who would you most want to go out to dinner with? Jim Benning, Travis Green or Francesco Accolini? Cool. Uh, I would probably say Jim Benning. I would say Jim Benning only because, uh, you know, I think we could probably have a pretty solid hockey discussion and maybe I'd be able to grind him down for a <laughs> couple of scoops. I, I feel like I see Travis enough and I'm sure Travis feels that he sees me enough. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he'd want to share a, a dinner table with me. Francesco, um, I mean, I've got lots of questions for him, but I don't know that I'd get many answers. I think I could have a meal where, I could actually ask Jim some questions and uh, you know, one of Jim's great traits is his honesty and he'd probably yes. answer a few of them. So I, I would pick Jim. Then. Great answer. Number five, early bird or night owl? I think I know the answer, but early bird or night owl? Uh, early bird. Uh, yeah. I, I'm up um, usually by six and wow. These days that doesn't help me because the days feel remarkably long. Um, but I mean, you know, in this job, you have to be a night owl too, obviously, to cover games. But uh, one thing that people don't really see or think about, I, I would imagine, in this job is you're always chasing the hockey club. I don't travel with them, obviously. They have mm. their charter and, you know, the broadcasters, the rights holders, they're on the, the, the team charter. But I travel commercially everywhere I go. And so, um, you know, NHL rules are that the team is supposed to be in the city it's going to play uh, the night before. Right. So they always fly out. Uh, so they'll play a game, you know, so they'll play in Nashville. If they're going to Chicago next, they'll play in Nashville. And then right after the Nashville game, fly out to Chicago. Uh, I overnight in that city because there's no commercial flights late at night. And then, you know, I've got to get up the next day and then chase the Canucks. So if, if they're going to practice in Chicago that next day, you know, quite often practice will be around noon. You know, I have to get up. And I'm at the whim of whatever flights are available to yeah. get me to that next city. Uh, now, Nashville to Chicago, there's probably lots of flights, but there are some places that, you know, they're just, you know, they're taking place like Columbus doesn't have, you know, it's got an airport, but it doesn't have, you know, access to Buffalo. You know, there are like, like I think back in the mid January, Canucks played in Buffalo in the afternoon on a Saturday, played in Minnesota on the Sunday afternoon, you know, when the schedule came out, I looked at that and I thought that's going to be a challenge because uh, <laughs> there just there aren't direct flights from Buffalo to Minnesota first of all, and it's middle January and sure enough there was this massive storm right up the the gut of the U.S. and all flights in and out of Chicago were grounded. You know I had to fly to Charlotte, North Carolina. I had to Buffalo, Charlotte, Charlotte to Minnesota. It took me eight hours of flying time that should have ultimately been about an hour and a half, uh, and, and that just comes in the territory, but. It's a lot of times, you know, you'll work till we talked about, you know, get work done in the rink midnight, can't get to sleep right away. But then I got a, like a four or 5 a.m. wake up call to get to the airport, to get to the, you know, to the next city so that I can cover practice on time. I can't miss practices. I mean, my job is whatever the Canucks are doing, I'm supposed to be there. And if, you know, if let's say a guy got hurt the night before, you need an update, like I got to be at that practice. So, um, you know, I would say a half dozen or more times a year there is a very short turnaround from getting back from the game, shutting down, trying to get a few hours of sleep and then being up and at the airport for a seven, eight, you know, and seven a.m. flight, you gotta be at the airport by six at the latest, usually earlier than that. And, you know, so th that's some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I, again, I'm not complaining. They come to the territory, love the job, but don't necessarily love 
uh, you know, three hours of sleep and then try to jump on a, a plane to, to get, because I'm not a great sleeper. I haven't mastered the art of sleeping on the airplane yet. Oh. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I re- and I, re- I remember you sharing that story both on the radio and through your Twitter. Uh, as, as opposed to planes for me, I'm asleep actually while they're doing their safety uh, construction. So oh, I, I guess yeah. I'm blessed that way. Yes. And lastly, number six of the six pack, who do you think is the next Canuck in the ring of honor after Alex Burroughs? Oh, um, Alex Adler is certainly headed there, whether he's the next one. Uh, I would say BXA. I think there's yeah. probably a groundswell of support. You know, did Kessler mean more to the Canucks ultimately at the top end of his game? Yeah. I said many times, I just, you know, the way it ended for Kessler here, and, and it was great to see on Sedin night. Like, I, I was happy to see the reaction he got, but that doesn't mean that he needs to be in the ring of honor necessarily. I, I mean, there is a, a line, and, you know, some guys are going to get over that line and some won't. And I just think the X uh, sort of, you know, along the lines of what Burroughs meant to the organization – uh, on the ice, off the ice, what it means to be a Canuck. Uh, you know, I, I think there's probably a spot there for for Biexa, Edler certainly. And yeah. then, you know, the, the Luongo one is, as it always is with Luongo, it's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will say Kevin Biexa will be the next Canuck in the Ring of Honor. Great answer. Awesome, Jeff. And where can people... Uh, catch up with you and follow you and your escapades both off season and in season on social media. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Patterson, Jeff Patterson with one T and Jeff with a J I, uh, Instagram. Obviously the account was set up to sort of allow people to follow me on the job and, you know, in my travels, not doing much traveling these days. So uh, I think Instagram sort of now pictures of me with the lawnmower, uh, <laughs> but at, at some point we'll get up, up and uh, covering hockey again. So, uh, at jpat1040 is the Instagram account, and uh, I have some fun there as well. And uh, yeah, on the radio, uh, you know, it's it slowed now here, uh, kind of everybody in a holding pattern waiting, but uh, at some point we'll get back up and, and running. And as I said, I would just like to know, you know, the draft ultimately and the date for free agency uh, so that we could all kind of dig in and, and start looking forward uh, rather than spinning our wheels but again i understand why we're in the holding pattern we are and and i don't anticipate that we're going to get a decision on uh games here you know there's just so many moving parts and so many questions that remain answered you know like the the borders are closed like there are a number of canucks that are in the states right now it's not as easy as um you know it may like like we seem to be ahead of the curve here in bc you know, you could see the Canucks at some point getting the all clear to get back on the ice in Vancouver. But if the borders are closed, you know, Pearson and Toffoli or in California, I think Hughes is back home in Michigan. You know, until you can get everybody assembled in one place, uh, and I think some of them might even be back, you know, in Sweden, like international travel. Who knows when we'll see international travel again? So, yeah. you know, there are moments where I sort of see that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow but uh, you know it it just i'll leave it in the hands of the scientists and the the people that uh, are a lot smarter than me that you know (laughs) hopefully we'll be able to produce answers in time but i still think we're quite a ways away and and you know as much look i would love hockey to be back as much as anybody but i've sort of lowered my expectations i think on any kind of resumption of play this season yeah. I know that the league's going to keep its options open, but I, I think there will come a point in time where they realize that it's just not going to happen. And uh, no, I, I kind of, in my mind, at the very least, am hoping that we can get back to uh, a full season on schedule for the start of, of next year in the fall. And that's a great point. As every day passes, even the most optimistic and positive people in the world, we have to be realistic as well. Jeff, Thank you so much for uh, spending some of your long weekend with me and uh, for sharing your wisdom and your insight with people watching this. I know um, I appreciate it. I know viewers on, on my YouTube channel will appreciate it as well. So thanks again and uh, take care of yourselves and of your wonderful family. We, we really appreciate it. Well, thanks for asking me and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in person rather than just in a little screen on my uh, telephone at some <laughs> point. Uh, hopefully we'll see everybody back at the rink. Uh, you know, we'll keep our distance, but uh, back at the rink at some point sooner rather than later. Awesome. Thanks again, Jeff. Take care. Well, if you made it this far, that means you listened to the whole thing or watched the whole thing. Thank you for doing so. You can see why Jeff is considered the number one beat reporter in the business when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks. 
like I said in my intro, so insightful, so witty. He just knows his stuff and he knows his, his stuff in context, what's important, what's not, and what affects this team uh, on a, not only day-to-day -day basis, but a long-term basis. And of course, what we fans want to ask and the things that we want to know about the team we love so much. So leave a comment below. I love to read, react and reply to it. Let me know what you thought about his answers and anything that he had to say. I would love to engage with you down in the comment section below. Gonna take a break from these interviews uh, tomorrow, do something else, but then come back with a couple more to end off the week. So I hope you stick with me for those. But in the meantime, subscribe if you'd like to, like this video if you like to. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and God bless and go Canucks go.